welcome back. And uh, today is the start of our olive harvest. Uh, every Portugal YouTube channel is going to be olive harvesting at the moment. Um, we just show you a little bit so it doesn't get too boring. We've also got some pasty making and uh, how we brine our olives as well. So come along and enjoy the ride. Well, the biggest problem we're going to have today with doing the olives is it's crazy windy. Here we go, uh, so we've got the tractor ready with some crates for the olives, um, more crates and nets on the back. We've got three 8 by 8 meter nets and one 6 by 6 meter net. And, but the essential tools for harvesting olives are two hand rakes, uh, two secateurs, some saws for pruning, a chainsaw for heavy duty pruning. Most importantly, we have this. This device is called a Verajador with a battery. Uh, it's a long pole with a shaky thing on the end, basically, and uh, it shakes the olive branches and knocks all the olives onto the floor or onto the nets. That's how it should be done. Here's our first uh, big tree to do. It's a, the type is a Cordeville, um, and away we go. As you can see, it's uh, pretty windy. So we're going to start off with pruning. We need to prune the um, shoots that are growing up around the bottom of the tree and also prune the inside that the shoots or what they call here, the droins, which are Portuguese for thieves. Um, so because they thieve, you know, they steal the energy from the tree, basically, is what the Portuguese guys say. Um, so we're pruning all that off to make access to the tree uh, for the shaky thing uh, much easier and also uh, easier to put the nets down to catch all the olives when they fall on the floor. So this is quite a complicated process. Um, we were taught by a very good friend of mine, Paolo, and his mother, believe it or not, uh, Georgina. And uh, Obviously, they've been doing it for a fair amount of years and um, they know what they're talking about. So um, we've sort of like a sponge soaked up everything they've they've suggested and we're both just following the way they do it, you know. What we are not doing, which the Portuguese uh, love to do when they harvest their olives, is prune the trees at the same time. Um, we feel that it's probably better to prune them a bit later as our, all our trees had a hard prune two years ago and they're just recovering from that now. So we'd rather prune them uh, after the harvest. Um, we can be a bit more judicial with the shape of the tree uh, and we're harvesting our olives with the Verajador. Uh, so it's, a, it's sort of a different way you prune a tree. So you want the olives to grow on thin, flexible branches rather than really stiff ones. So it makes harvesting easier, yeah? But um, we're hoping for this year maybe 900 kilos. Um, last year, because we pruned really hard the year before, we only had 170 kilos. Our first year here, uh, when there was no pruning happening anywhere in any description, we had 700 kilos. So we're hoping for sort of a bumper harvest this year, two years down the road after a massive um, pruning session. At the moment, I'm up in the tree, cutting off uh, some more prunings and just picking them up and um, taking them away out of the way of the nets. Um, so we can obviously lay the nets down when I finish hacking the tree.
just on the left of the shop now and he's just walking past or up to it blocks it out now is uh, Max's repositioned and revamped kennel due to the really high winds we've had um, the roof of the kennel actually blew off um, and I've re waterproofed the outside as well just to make sure So this is the shop, uh, just to show you what I've been doing, pruning inside. So we've cleaned away all the sort of vertical growth, uh, the drawings, as I've said before, this bit that grow here, here, and here, um, just to give us better access on the inside. Uh, so you can stand in there with the, uh, the razor door and uh, shake off a few olives. It gives you a bit more room inside the tree. Also, allows more sunshine into the tree so here we go uh, with the nets just before we put the nets down there's obviously the winds have been a real issue and we're just picking up a few of the uh, decent olives that have blown onto the floor and here we start with the nets so this first net is eight meters by eight meters um, and they have a split and a center ring uh, to put around the tree so it, it, it makes things fairly simple but things aren't simple when the winds are this strong we're having to get things to weigh down the net as you can see because um, they're, they're just basically blowing as soon as we lay it down it's blowing away so we're, we're, I'm gathering stones and crates and uh, nets and other things just to to stop that happening another net here on the edge because we're fairly close to the edge of the tree so an eight meter so four meters from the center isn't enough um, so we've just made the catchment area a little bit wider with, a, with an extra net and this is me plugging in the verasure door to the uh, battery in a crate and then away we go so this process of me electronically vibrating the olives off and just doing as much as you can by hand and um, basically we've got nearly 70 trees to to go through in this process so it takes a while uh, two of us were hoping it would take us three days it's probably because the amount of olives we had going to take us about four days so we'll see how it goes before maybe five days
So this is a slow motion shot of the Verasia door doing its thing. Um, I'm filming as Angie's operating it. It's uh, basically it just rattles the branches or should I say tickles the branches and just tickles the olives out of the tree. Now that we've tickled all the olives out of the tree um, and just getting a few ones I've missed, uh, you basically you lift the nets up and scoop everything into one big heap and then we put them into crates. Most people use bags, um, basically just collecting your olives and not spilling them all over the floor.
So this is most of the olives from this one tree that we started on. Uh, just got to get in the boxes now and then move the net onto the next tree. Put an empty crate on. We're measuring zero, yeah? It doesn't weigh a lot, but we're bang on zero. So let's see how many kilos we have. So that's 32 pound. Something, something kilos. <laughs> so that's 32 pound, which just a rough calculation in my head is 14.54 kilos ish. I'll find out what it is. 38. This one's 38 pound, which is 15 come on, kilos. Hang on. Just checking this one for quality purposes. Oh, that's let's say 38 pound. 38 pound, it's about 16 kilos. So let's call just for argument's sake. Each crate's going to be about 15 kilos. We'll see how many we get off this one tree. So there we go, our first Cordeville olive tree harvest. So we got that many, and they're just over 15 kilos a crate. We're going to call that nearly 80 kilos. Can we add? Next up, we got these four little trees. Next to the big one we did, this one here, not much on, so Andrew's just going to hand pick them. And I'm going to just give these a rattle now. Sorry, not a rattle, a tickle with my olive tickler. So here we go, our second Cordeville behind me. Second Cordeville this season in this part of the land. So uh, I'm expecting about the same as the first one, about 80 kilos. Let's see how it goes. So this tree, uh, the other big Cordeville in this section, only made 60 kilos. But we had 20 or 30 odd kilos from all the other little trees. And just, and just hand picking. Hand picker! So moving down the terrace, this is the next lot we got to pick. So mostly small trees, small Cordevilles. But there are couple of our biggest producers, Galega. Now the wind's got up. <coughs> Galegas, and these are really good for oil. And there's uh, all the rest in here, this, this direction, are Galegas. At the moment, we've got two lots of olives in water. They've been in, sitting in water for the last three days, so I'm now going to change the water. Um, most things recommend that you do this every day, but I find that we only really need to do it every two or three days. So they sit in water for quite a while, actually. And then once the water has sort of done its business and extracted the, and I can't remember what 
chemical it is in olives that give them their bitterness. So we just refresh the water and leave them sit in this for another two or three days and then I'll ch keep changing the water for about four weeks, so about a month of water changes. This is the same things with the cordobils. These are the main eating olives. These are the nice big, big ones. So these are Nick's favourite olives. So I'll just get the lid. looking olives. These are going to be really really nice once they're all brined. So again just more water. Once the olives have been soaked in water for about a month I then make a brine solution but first of all we have to slice each olive a couple of times just to allow the um, brine solution to actually get into the flesh of the olive and help with the brining process. So all these will then need to be individually sliced, but you can't, don't slice them too far down because if you get to the stone you get it, that's where the bitterness is. So these, okay. so the olives will be ready in about 12 months after they start gone through the brining process. Um, what I often do as well is change the brine solution part way through. So I check each batch, um, Go through them because occasionally you'll get some that'll go soft so we just chuck those out rebrine and seal them up and enjoy in 12 months time so what you end up with is jarfuls of gorgeous eating olives just like this mm. Just a few of the Galega olives that we're going to brine um, and just sorting out the, the green ones that I picked earlier. Um, they look like big blueberries. They're not big blueberries. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the reason, well these are quite big for Galega actually, if you look at them. Because when they're brined they, they shrink a little bit. Um, Ange loves the, the black ones like this so they're for her really. That we're having, so, guess what we're having for tea? Potato, skirt, onion, and unfortunately turnip, not swede. But, next best thing. And there we have them, ready to go. Uh, so, meat, potatoes, swede and onions, several knobs of butter, lots of white pepper, black pepper, and some salt. Now I'm just going to crimp them up and uh, stick them in the oven. Okay. So just a quick, just a quick um, roll over. There we go, ready for the oven. Um, bit of a mistake here. But, <laughs> look at my hand, they're massive. So, fresh out the oven. Oh, lovely. The repair held up here, but um, just about to eat them now. There we go, you don't quite fit the plate, so I'm gonna have to uh, sort of do an operation on it. Oh, I need gravy too. Gotta to love it. So here we have a very excited Max. Um, this is his house, which obviously, and the shade above it, which is obviously just all blown away because of the horrific winds we've been having. Um, so about time we upgraded Max's home. There's stuff strewn everywhere. 
um, there's the the sunshade we had for him and the roofs off and stuff um, so we're going to move him to a new position here uh, where I have some um, space age waterproofing material donated by our neighbors and, and good friends Jürgen and his wife So it's an aluminium foil on the outside, uh, bitumen based on the inside. I have some copper nails left over from all the work I used to do, a lot of roofing work in the UK with slates. Uh, so we're just going to fix this to the timber with slate, with slate nails, copper slate nails. Um, basically the whole lot is built on a, uh, a pallet underneath. Just a really simple build and now we're going to just nail this stuff on. Uh, just to keep Max super dry in the winter and obviously the aluminium will, the, will reflect the uh, sunshine and keep it cooler in the summer so he has a bit, we're going to add another shaded area for him as well um, just to make him more comfortable. So I'm fitting the roof that blew off it's just made of two bits of uh, insulation to make everything lighter uh, and obviously cooler for Max in the summer. Um, yeah, just uh, fitting it back on and screwing it back down now. So there we have it, blanket installed, uh, roof on, Max not terribly interested to be honest but um, this is his new house, fully waterproof and uh, nice and warm and nice and dry. Even a fat guy like me can fit into there so there's plenty of room for Max but he won't come in with me. Still reluctant to go in there, so uh, he, he, he's just wondering why we're all in his paddock, basically. There we go. What a lovely dog. Thanks for watching, guys. Hope you found that useful. Thanks for your support. And uh, next week we'll be doing the follow-up video to this one, uh, taking the olives to the Ligar and the whole process of how they make olive oil. Um, and we'll also be showing you some other interesting things next week. Stay tuned. Bye. Bye. You little boys cuddling together. Oh, lovely.